So I will I will briefly start with with tactility because might have some people here that do not know what tactility at all is. So let me give you. Um, I go. I mean, it's only about giving to those that do not know about tactility on on its own. So tactility is a is a Horizon 2020 project. So we are in the third year. Uh, we have a main aim to include rich and meaningful tactile information to novel interaction systems through electrical stimulation for closed loop tactile interaction with virtual environments. So it's about virtual environments and to add like a tactile sense to give a tactile feedback to the people that are using virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality systems as an additional as an additional um, cue or means um, uh, modality. Um, to develop library about haptic effects so that we can represent different effects that we have in virtual reality. So we are confronted with a physical environment, but the but uh, state of the art virtual environment is lacking besides the visual and audio cues very often all the rest in, in terms of perception of haptics and, and, and so on. So that's the main focus of, uh, of, of tactility. So in, in the discussion here, so we had today uh, the, the pleasure to, to host our advisory board and to bombard them with questions uh, about uh, usefulness uh, of such a tactile environment. So this was the exercise that we did, uh, did in, the, in the end of, of that project. So we looked at uh, a number of questions. Um, uh, one of the questions was, is there a killer app that such a technology of giving tactile feedback can be uh, brought into, in, into this uh, VR XR environment. I mean, the, 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 the guys here from, from the VR market side, they are um, involved in bringing to companies uh, solutions of virtual reality or they are companies to give to end users like patients uh, other feedback than what they normally have with very limited cognitive abilities uh, to get a full immersion of uh, an environment that helps them to do like exercising. Or we have companies that uh, provide uh, gloves to give more precise um, feedback uh, about where is the position of, uh, of, of the finger, the hand, the manipulators uh, in a virtual environment, which is also one of the weak points. So we were discussing about, okay, what is the market? What is the, the killer app? So in, in conclusion, what, uh, what our discussion gave out or resulted in is that it's not necessarily a question about a killer app, but it is more the question about what is the added value or what is really the technology bringing. So uh, with respect to that, it was also uh, considered, at least in the current applications of, of virtual reality, where it's uh, rather a market for professionals that have very highly sophisticated demands so that price there is not necessarily an issue but there needs to be the counter value of course when the cost is is high we were discussing in uh, in another part about about usability so user friendliness, uh, how can a system be brought and applied? We were identifying what could be the problems there. 
um, the main problem was clearly seen in the time of donning, doffing, and specifically the time of, of calibration of such a system. So the need to go into an automated way of calibration or a calibration over time while the system is used. So the performance of the system is not required at the starting point to be perfect. It can evolve, it can improve. Uh, the customers or end users of, of VR technology uh, are not necessarily dependent in this technology on, on a high precision from, from second one of, of the application, but want to have, uh, want, do not want to be loaded with additional burdens in terms of donning, doffing, um, of uh, usability issues. Uh, lay, lastly, we were discussing about, about barriers. So we did not consider price as a, as a barrier when the performance, when what is added by the technology uh, is, 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 a, is an added value to, to the current uh, application. Um, there were not other barriers really recognized that at the moment. Um, I mean, one of the barriers that already had been identified in the morning in the presentation was that there is a, a learning curve. So, so a person needs to go through a learning curve. So uh, you cannot get that technology, apply it the first two seconds and being benefiting from that. But probably that's with almost all the tools that we are using in our lives uh, quite the same. I mean, we learn to drive a car before we appreciate <laughs> to drive a car. Um, and the same is with, with, many, with, with many or most of the other uh, usages uh, that we have. Um, am I missing something? In, in that summary. So this was the summary of the tactility side. Um, I think what still is the open question uh, for most of our stakeholders here is, yeah, what is it? What is this tactility? How does that feel? Um, and, and these questions, I mean, we have our advisors already for two and more years. Uh, but all, only through teams in a virtual environment. So today is the first uh, opportunity to get this one. And with my side note, of course, as you are going to experience it probably the first time, <laughs> give it half an hour <laughs> to, <laughs> to get used to, to, to it. Um, so that's more or less uh, how I would like to close here the part from, from the tactility side. So, Ainara, yeah. you, you can share the screen. Share, share, and then it should. Yeah, but I'm sharing things, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Wait. It's only. I have always an issue to find my mouse that goes completely the wrong way. Oh. Okay, I didn't prepare any slides regarding the DH Hero, but uh, so I'm using some slides from Miguel, <laughs> but just to put some context on, on the project. Uh, uh, on the other room, we, we have a, a very interesting session today, uh, organizing them under the DH Hero project. Uh, the Chiro, for those who doesn't know, uh, it's a, a pan-European project where uh, there are 17 partners, if I'm right. 17, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the aim is uh, to, to create a, a platform of uh, robotics technologies for healthcare. Uh, yeah, to speed up the innovation and, and reduce the time to market of the SMEs. 
So, uh, yeah, this uh, project uh, is also a cascade founding, uh, and uh, we have we had because I think that uh, they are mostly closed right now. But uh, we had different calls to found the the projects of uh, SMEs uh, on this topic. Uh, the, the event uh, was organized uh, within the PP7, uh, where the objective is to harmonize and, and collect uh, standards and, and best practices on that could apply to these technologies. And uh, yeah, we have today very interesting talks from some experts on standardization, on, on interoperability and software and also two companies that are working on, on robotics technologies, and they also share with us their experience applying the, the standards and the rules and best practices that apply to the, to the developments. So at the end, we also presented uh, some results uh, from this BP7 that we are leading, and um, uh, we have couple of tools on the Hero website that are available for those who are interested on, on them. One is regarding the, the safety uh, rules or standards that could apply to the technology, and the other one is related to ethical and legal approvals that can be applied or are needed for the experimentation with humans. And um, Ah, and also we have we have another database with uh, the collection of different standards that could apply. And, and at the end, uh, we make well, we have already launched a, a survey on on the use of the standards by the companies uh, for interoperability, software development, and also quality. I presented some results of that. We can share them with all of you. But uh, we also launched uh, an online survey with the audience. We were few people, but <laughs> at least we got some results. Uh, mainly the results are that uh, the most used one are the 9,000 ISO regarding the, the quality. Also the 62304 for the software life cycle is also well known. And also the, the quality for the medical devices size so is, is also used. But uh, probably the, the standards or best practices available for interoperability are not so known right now. So this is one of our aim in the project to share this information with, with everybody that's everyone who is working on robotic technologies. Yes, yeah, so so this was a part that we did not discuss in in our in in our discussion. I mentioned and I asked also the, uh, specifically the company members to think about about standardization. Um, I mean, on this tactile experience, on the virtual reality, um, and and standards. I'm not so sure that there is a lot available. There is a quasi standard in the software tool that is used. So everybody is uh, using Unity, at least from all those that I have seen. And, and this gives like a best practice uh, approach in, in terms of how uh, our systems are implemented or what then also is made available. So. Um, I think we, we saw also that there are many standard applications or use cases that are used by different labs, by different people, by different companies, and that there is a standard on, on, on that. Um, how relevant a virtual reality or extended reality standard is with uh, in comparison to a medical robotics standard i mean how close that is uh, probably would also be a, a topic for for discussion i don't know if we want to ask here for a few statements of when we have already the experts here 
from <laughs> from the medical robotics. So, uh, in how far is a virtual robot or a VR system that can be considered as a virtual robot uh, from a standard point of view relevant? Uh, or how much are the standards for physical uh, robots relevant for virtual robots? Do you see an answer, Diego, <laughs> on <laughs> such a question? I don't see that. We are working with mostly with uh, physical, not virtual. So we use virtual just to to prove it in some part of the information. What we are considering now is uh, the field of uh, humanoids. There, the virtual part is uh, the that is quest, no? Whether we can test things in the virtual environment, and this is becoming real life. And how those are virtual machines, which are the real machines. We can predict the behavior of real machines using virtual machines. How you are considering now virtual reality? So I, I well understood this it's a way to improve the interaction of the human and the human and the machine. I don't know because it's completely another thing. Yeah, yeah, but the fact is that uh, I mean we make the virtual much more physical or I mean with this providing sensory input into the human about the virtual environment, about how this environment for 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 the person is perceived gets more and more physical um, versus on on the other side as you say when you are talking about about uh, physical robots they are or i mean there there is a there is a big industry movement to have all the tools available that that all the certification can be done in a virtual way and not doesn't need to be done in in a, in a in a physical way or not in a pure only physical way so that that the virtual model can so somewhere i see convergence i see a lot of convergence on on the two uh, yeah, and one, one aspect of this i think it's uh, fast Standards is the difficulty of, of taking the human out of the, of the out. So let's say you can test in a machine, you can test the machine three times or ten times, and well, you're done. And you want to prove the effectiveness of, 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 of the change is interacting with humans like an exoskeleton, and you need to do tests with I don't know how many people to prove this. And and this is it's a burden, and I think no company wants to get to this. They have to. It's, it's a medical device because you need to have a clinical trial to prove the effectiveness. But if you want to just prove the effectiveness of the assistance, how can you take the human out of the loop? Maybe here the virtual environment could be a way to. Um, to limit two more tests with less uh, experimental burden. That's a question we have. So I know maybe some aspects can be used with reality. Uh, no, because it's a thing that I don't know. <laughs> Actually, we can work very interesting also in this other part. Any other? Comment on that or opinion? Yes, tonight. So we have some uh, project with to uh, connect uh, your factories or the robots and use virtual reality to put the human in the loop of the simulation to, uh, to test how the people is going to react. Uh, when they are going to work with uh, 
so many uh, new robots, uh, collaborative robots, and how, uh, how uh, we are going to implement some kind of uh, security for some of the people inside uh, in factories. I, I don't know too much about it, but uh, for example, in Unity, uh, as uh, uh, I think not too much time ago, uh, the LOS, uh, the Robots Operating System, inside the Unity. So we now uh, could uh, connect our virtual reality environments directly using the programming language that's, uh, that the robots are using. So I think this is a movement to try to uh, uh, probably physicalize the virtual environment or, or virtualize the physical environment. That is something that I think is going to happen and, and is happening just now. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a very good uh, uh, topic, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, I thank Unai. I think this is more or less bringing the, the story a bit together, but I do not want to steal demo time. So.